Welcome to Life Church Live at Your Place. We are so glad that you've joined us today. We're going to sing together and pray together and learn from scripture together. And I encourage you to fully engage with us in all of that. Use the reaction buttons and comment and reply to other people's comments below just to keep the conversation going. After the service, I'd encourage you to stay with us for a chat with the pastors so we can connect together just like we would have over morning tea after church. We're going to get started in just a moment. So wherever you are, whoever you're with, grab your Bible, grab a coffee, gather your family together and let's worship God. Good morning, Life Church. As you know, it's the first Sunday of the month, which means communion for us. And we're in this series of Acts, and so I've been thinking about um, that verse in Acts 2 that says that for, for church, for them, it was committing to fellowship and committing to prayer and the breaking of bread. And that's what we're going to do this morning in worship is we're going to um, celebrate communion, celebrate what Christ did for us on the cross. So I hope that you have those elements prepared before you. If you don't, you can pause the video and grab those because we're going to be doing that um, as we get into worship. And so um, this morning, I pray that you remember that we are the church united wherever we are. And this morning, we're going to celebrate communion in many different places, um, but remembering that same sacrifice through the elements that we have for communion this morning. So let's go into a time of worship and reflection on what Christ has done for us. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love. Sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we look to the sun. Salvation tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light. Freedom shaking up the atmosphere. As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Beyond the skies above. Love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Creation waking up to kingdom come. See the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Now forever lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness to his endless light. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us. The everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior. See the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior. See the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. To 
beyond the skies above love reaching out for us the everlasting one jesus our god beyond the skies above love reaching out for us the everlasting one jesus our god oh we look to the sun set our eyes on our savior see the image of love sing his praises forever oh we look to the sun set our eyes on our savior see the image of love sing his praises forever oh we look to the sun Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit. in his blood. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and
As we sing this song, Living Hope, would you prepare your hearts for communion? As we come to the communion table this morning, I hope you've prepared at home the bread and the juice as the symbols of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have them ready before you now, I suggest that you pause the service stream right now and gather those elements and then join back with us as soon as you're ready. Communion is a time to reflect, it is a time to remember, and it is a time to celebrate. We reflect on our lives, the struggle with sin and the need for personal forgiveness from Jesus. We remember that Christ Jesus in fact did go to the cross and pay the ultimate price for our sin. So we don't need to pay that price again, we're set free. And it's also a time of celebration as we give thanks to God for his goodness to us in Christ Jesus. If you do have the bread and the juice before you now, would you take a moment to bow your head with me and to prepare your heart to meet with God through this special time that Jesus instituted when he met with his disciples in the upper room. Lord Jesus, come and meet with us now. We open our hearts to you. Would you, would you remind us of what you have done for us, would you help us to grab hold of all of what you have done and all that means for us to today as we are set free to live as your people in this world. We give you thanks that you have set us free and we press into you in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat this now, remembering that Christ Jesus died for you and give thanks in your heart for the sacrifice that he has made. And after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread or drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you. Drink this now, remembering that his blood was shed to set you free. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again. As we reflect on our sin, knowing that we cannot 
earn or deserve or work hard enough to gain what is required to enter heaven. We have sinned, we have fallen short, yet you have paid the ultimate price. We remember Jesus' death on the cross and the forgiveness purchased for us. And we celebrate that you have forgiven us through the, the dead, death of Jesus, through the shed blood of Jesus, through the broken body of Jesus on the cross, that we could be forgiven, that we could be set free. And we live in that freedom, in that uh, state of forgiveness, of grace, because of what you have done for us. And we today bring our needs to you, our concerns to you. We bring ourselves to you. Lord, there are things on our heart that we want to share with you. The world is in turmoil and, uh, and that bothers us, it concerns us. We want to see you at work in those circumstances and situations. We think particularly of what's been happening in America. We think of what's been happening around the world. We think of what's been happening in our own families and our own lives. And we reach out to you. You came down from heaven to earth to set us free. And you hear our prayers and you are still active in this world by your Holy Spirit. And so we say, come, Holy Father, do your work in us, be seen in this world at work, bringing about your purposes and plan, that you would be glorified. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus blessed my living
Hi everyone, I've got some announcements for you. We're watching with anticipation what the government says about relaxing the rules for churches to meet back again. Um, we're hoping that that will be soon, but at this stage we still have a lot of preparation to do and we don't want to do that until we have all that preparation done and, and until it's safe for you. At this stage, we won't be meeting back until at least 100 people can meet at a time. Um, and we'll have to just wait and see around that. But we are eager and we're looking forward to seeing you all again really soon. Thanks for those who have been really faithful in giving their tithes and offerings. We want to um, continue to do that. And if you've been one of those people that has just been saving them up at home because it's been too awkward to give in another way, we'd like to encourage you to drop those into the church office. Um, the office is open from Tuesday to Friday, 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. So just feel free to drop in. If you've got any questions or anything else you wanna know, you can call the office in those hours or pop in as well. Life groups are also waiting eagerly to start back again. We're getting there, we're pretty close. We've just got a few other compliance things that we have to deal with beforehand. So hold the phone, keep, keep waiting, and our life group leaders will get in touch with you as soon as we're able to start back again. Thanks and have a great week. Acts chapter two, verses one through to four, the Holy Spirit comes. On the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. We've been studying the events that occurred in the days and months following the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. These events are recorded for us in the book of Acts and today we're in the second chapter and in verse four it says, everyone present, that's all the 120 men and women, who were waiting together at the end of chapter one in Jerusalem for this event to take place, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Now we talked last week about the fact that the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And previous to this, these, these men and these, these disciples, those who they had been followers of Jesus previously, they had been friends of Jesus, they had been near him, they had been with him, but they had not been one with him. Now, something wonderful happens here. The life of God comes to inhabit their humanity. The actual life of God passes into their lives. That's what happened at Pentecost. And it's the essence, it's the core of Christianity. The reason why Jesus died is that we would be forgiven of our sin, not simply that we might be clean, that we might be cleansed, but that having been cleansed, the Holy Spirit can now come into our lives as the life of Jesus in us, imparting the life of God to us. And this continues to be the work of the Spirit today. You see, everything else in the Christian life flows from this, that his life is actually imparted within us. It's implanted within us and we become sharers of the life of Christ together. Previously, Jesus had inhabited one body, but now he comes by his spirit to create a new body, his church, and he dwells in corporately within those who are his people. And we become one with him. In fact, this is what Jesus had prayed in John chapter 17, that same night that Jesus took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body, eat this in remembrance me. And later on that night, he prayed for them in, in John chapter 17. And in verse 11, he says this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And later on in verse 20, he, he continues in this prayer and he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us that the world might believe that, that you 
have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, just as we are one. Now, over and over again in this prayer, Jesus makes it very clear that his prayer, his heart, his desire is that we would be one with him, that we would be one with one another and one with him in the same way that he is one with the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that we'll all be one in agreement, one, one mind, all of us agreeing and thinking the same things. That would be nice, but that's not what he's talking about. Jesus is praying that we might know the oneness that he has with the Father. Now that oneness, what, what is that oneness that Jesus has with the Father? He's not talking about oneness of deity, although it's true that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit together are God, they do share oneness of deity, but that's not what he's talking about. We're not all going to become little gods. You're in the wrong religion if you, if you believe that. It's not a oneness of deity. What it is, is a oneness of activity. John chapter 14, that same night in the upper room, he says this, verse 10. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me doing his work. He's saying, my words are not my words. The words you hear from me are my Father's words and the works that you see through my life are not mine. They are the Father working in me, Father living in me, doing his work through me. Which is why then he says later on in the next verse, in verse 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. In other words, the miracles that you see are a demonstration of the fact that the Father is at work in and through me. This, this is the oneness that Jesus had with the Father. And it is the oneness that he prayed for his disciples to enjoy with him. And it's what happened at Pentecost. This prayer was fulfilled at Pentecost. From then on, you will see those disciples are very different people. Because now, the explanation for their activity is that Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, is operating at work in them and through them. Previously, you could explain everything Peter did simply in terms of Peter. It's his personality. It's his impetuousness. It's his spontaneity. It's his big mouth. All of the things that we know about Peter before this event. But after Pentecost, the only explanation is this, that it's God at work in and through him by his Holy Spirit. You see, it's not about what you do for God. It's about what you allow God to do in and through you. Now, does that mean we come ro become robots? No, but it does mean that as we seek to live our lives for him and obey what God gives us to do, that our dependence is on him and his strength. It's his activity. Now, it's interesting that when Luke describes this, he describes it in this way. He says, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled is an interesting word in this context. It's a word that Luke uses quite often in the book of Acts, and it's used in a variety of contexts. We tend to use the word filled in terms of topping up. So this glass here isn't quite full. So I will pour some more water and I'll, I'll fill it up, I'll, I'll top it up. And we tend to think of the Holy Spirit in those kinds of terms, you know, like a liquid that we can pour into our lives. The, the fuel tank in your car is getting low and so you pour some more in, you fill it up. But I need to tell you today, the Holy Spirit is not like a liquid. He is a person. The scripture makes this very clear. You can't have more or less of him. He is a person. I can't have more or less of you. You're either here or you're not. You're either in your land room with other people or you're not. I can't have more or less of you, but I can have more or less of your attention, but not more or less of you. And the spirit is either within us or he is not. So what does this mean? What does it mean then to be filled with the spirit? Well, Luke uses this word filled 
nine times in the book of Acts in relation to the Holy Spirit, but he also uses the word in relation to other things. For instance, in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, he says about the people in Jerusalem, it says, everyone was filled with awe. What does it mean that they were filled with awe? In Acts chapter 3, verse 10, when the people gathered around the man who gets healed at the temple gate at Jerusalem, it says they were filled with wonder and amazement. What does it mean then to be filled with wonder and amazement? Chapter 5 in Acts, uh, verse 12, it speaks about the Sadducees. When they saw the crowds that the apostles were drawing, the attention that the apostles were getting, the Sadducees, it says, were filled with jealousy. Again, what does it mean that they were filled with with jealousy. Acts chapter 13, it says the disciples were filled with joy. What does it mean that they were filled with joy? This is a very common word that Luke uses in his writings. What does it mean to be filled with wonder, filled with amazement, filled with joy, filled with or filled with jealousy? Does it mean that someone stands up and and declares, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to know that I, I have just been filled with wonder. I'm full of wonder. Wonderful. And those watching might say, oh, he's filled with wonder. He just said so. Is that what that means? No. What it means to be filled with wonder, amazement, filled with joy or jealousy, is something more than that. And if we come to understand what this means to be filled, maybe we'll understand what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to suggest to you today that what it means to be filled with wonder or amazement or jealousy or joy is that these emotions, they dominated their personalities and they determined their behavior. The the wonder and the amazement dominated their personalities and determined their behavior. So when Luke records what happens in Jerusalem when the man is healed at the temple gates and it says they were filled with wonder and amazement, What it means is their eyes grew bigger than saucers and they were saying, wow, and they were jumping up and down with excitement. And so he records they were filled with wonder and excitement. Look at them. It dominated their personality and it determined their behavior. And so what does it mean? When the Sadducees were filled with jealousy, it means that when they were, that when they felt threatened, by the fact that the people wanted to hear from the disciples and not for them, Luke says the way they acted, the way they behaved, the way they were bent on destroying the work that God was doing, he says, well, they were filled with envy and jealousy because jealousy dominated their personality and it determined their behavior. And so what does it mean when he says the disciples were filled with joy? Well, it means that when they met together in Acts chapter 13, there was such delight that you could see it in their faces and you could hear it in their voices and you could see it in their body language, that they were filled with joy. It dominated their personality and it determined their behavior. And so what do you think it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It means that the Holy Spirit dominates our personality and determines our behavior. That the way that we live and that we behave and that we act and that we react is determined by the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. He dominates our personality and he determines our behavior. Now, it's very interesting that the, the first description given of, by the crowds of what was happening in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it says that they, they described it this way. They said, these men have had too much wine. They're drunk. Something is affecting them. Something is changing their behavior. It's changing their personalities. And you know, the only occasion where Paul uses this phrase to be filled with the Holy Spirit is in Ephesians chapter 5. And he says this, he says, do not be drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Paul is using being drunk as an illustration of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's a good question to consider. How do you know if a person is drunk? Is it because they stand up and they say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just declaring today that I'm drunk. I've had too much to drink. That's not how we know a person is drunk. People don't do that. How do you know a person is drunk? Well, it's very simple. If they've had too much alcohol, it will dominate their personality and determine their behavior. You know that they're drunk because of the way they stagger down the street or because of how they slur their words or, or because you can smell it on them. These are three giveaways. There are three evidences 
that a person is drunk by the way they walk, by the way they talk, and by the way they smell. And I want to suggest to you today that you know the way you know a person is filled with the Holy Spirit is the way they walk and the way they talk and the way they smell. Let me explain. First of all, by the way you walk. That is, by the way you walk through this life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, walk in the Spirit. That is, as you walk through this life, as you live this life, it is the Spirit who is determining how you live and act and behave. Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, walk in love. And we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so as you walk through this life, there will be a love that flows through you. And so walk in love. 1 John 1 says, walk in the light. And so as you walk through this life, there will be things that mark your personality and determine your behavior that can only be explained in terms of the Holy Spirit at work within you. Second evidence is the way that we talk. And in Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's going on in someone's heart, just listen to what comes out of their mouth, especially when things are not going their way. Because what happens in your heart is going to find its way out through the mouth. That's why in all 10 references after Pentecost to people being filled with the Spirit or full of the Spirit, something actually happens with their mouth. Here on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke in other languages as the Spirit enabled. Later on, when uh, Paul said to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5, his very next words are, speak to one another and sing and make music in your heart to God. He says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you, you, you have something to say. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you will want to sing His praises. There's something worth singing about. That's why when we meet together, we sing. But it's not just the way we walk and the way we talk, it's also the way we smell. Now, no nudging the person sitting beside you for how they smell. This, this is a period of isolation and nobody's going to know whether you've used deodorant or not. And this is a safe place. But if you turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul writes this. He says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to another an aroma that brings life. And what this means is that there is an atmosphere of our lives that points to Jesus. To some, it's the smell of life and it draws them in and lifts them up. But to those who reject him, it is the smell of death. And so when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, it changes how we walk. It changes how we talk. It changes how we smell the aroma of our lives. Our lives are transformed by the life of Christ in us through his Holy Spirit. As we're drawn into union with Jesus. These men and women on the day of Pentecost, 120 of them in Jerusalem, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, the first thing that happened is that they came into union with God. The Spirit brings us into connection with Christ. Jesus said, Father, as you and I are one, because I am in you and you are in me, may they also be one as they are in me and I am in them, that the world might know that you sent me that the world will see something about these men and women's lives, that the world would see something about your and my life that is inexplicable apart from the fact that God is alive in them, in us, by his Holy Spirit. You see, it's not what we do for God. It's about what you allow God to do in and through you. When we come into union with him by his Holy Spirit, who dwells within us. You give light, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. 
You give light. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your prayer in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise, it's your bread in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Maybe this morning, you don't know him at all. Maybe you're watching this and you've never come into a relationship with God. You've never realized that it's even possible to have this kind of a relationship. Perhaps you've heard that you can be forgiven and that's a beautiful thing. But it's so much more than that. You can know the indwelling presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit indwelling you, filling you, at work in you so that when you go back to your place of work tomorrow, back to your office, back to your school, in your home, there will be things about your life that have no explanation other than that God has been at work in you and through you, putting you in the right place at the right time for the right reasons with the right people, guiding your path as He has promised to. So I want to invite you this morning, if you've never come to Christ, if you've never come into that relationship with God, if you've never received the Spirit of God for yourself, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And if you've never confessed your sin and invited the Holy Spirit to come and live within you, would you pray with me? Are you ready? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I realize that I am separated from you by my sin. Thank you that you died for me to forgive me. And I ask you, Lord, for your forgiveness to cleanse me. I believe that you rose again and that you are alive today and that you have in fact sent your Holy Spirit into this world. And I ask that he may come and live in my heart and my life this day. I surrender myself to you, that you might live in me and give me the assurance that I belong to you by the inner witness of your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for hearing my prayer. Thank you for coming into my life. Lord Jesus, now I belong to you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I ask that you would reach out to us and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out
much for joining us today. I hope you've really been blessed. If you'd like to know more about following Jesus, just go to life-church.org.au forward slash Jesus. And if you'd like to know more about giving to support the ministry of Life Church, go to life-church.org.au forward slash give. And if you have any prayer needs, we have a prayer button on the, the website, life-church.org.au, and you can click on that and get through to um, myself and we will um, pray for you for that need. We'd love for you now to stay around for a chat with the pastors and that will be on Zoom. If you need any details for that, please just check the comments section below this video. Thanks very much. Bye.